Live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here inside theCUBE live in Las Vegas for IBM Insight. This is IBM's premier show around big data analytics, formerly called Information On Demand Now, rebranded as IBM Insight. I'm John Furrier. I'm with Dave Vellante and our next guest is Steve Mills, Senior Vice President, Group Executive, Software and Systems at IBM, an industry legend, leader of the helm, captain of the ship. Welcome back to theCUBE. Good to yeah. see you again. Always great to be in theCUBE. <laughs> <laughs> we love we love chatting with you. It's like you know, it's like yeah, tech athletes rolling up sleeves. You're in the day to day. IBM is still on course. I mean, not the shift is not happening. You guys are staying on vectoring into this market, cloud, mobile, software at the center of the value proposition. Um, this show's focused on the big data analytics. We talked to you mm -hmm. recently at yep. Pulse. What's different? And, and just quickly break down the core thing between this and the other event, Pulse, and now it's going to be called Interconnect. Well, obviously, this event's very much focused on. Uh, analytics, uh, information management, so whether it's you know, data warehousing, database, you know, big data, little data, structured, unstructured, uh, SQL, no SQL, uh, you know, SQL on no SQL, you know, every conceivable combination <laughs> of technology uh, associated with all things analytics, right? And so that'll pick up all kinds of areas, uh, you know, including things like Internet of Things, which is very much a big data challenge. Uh, security these days, cybersecurity, big data challenge. Uh, you know, fraud, anti-money yeah. laundering. Uh, you know, obviously into sentiment analytics and and customer uh, relationship. Uh, and so it's a very broad range of topics uh, that, but all tied back to this whole area of analytics and data. So one of the things we're seeing in the theme here is speed, large scale, and obviously software, right? So this is your, <laughs> you're in the software and systems, you're the head, mm -hmm. head honcho there. So talk about what's going on with the cloud dynamic, okay? You got large scale computation available, software's at the center of the value proposition, the new models are emerging, Ray Wang calls this area of, of insight around the future where IBM is going to really mm -hmm shine with their software. So you're, in, you're leading the software team at large scale. Cloud is large scale. What are the things that are in place and where, you got, where do you guys see the leverage for IBM? Well, you know, specific to cloud, cloud is obviously a dimension of what the market is doing today. And it relates to you know, where do things run? Uh, where can I run things? And can I, through leveraging cloud uh, related deployment, can I get better leverage on economics? Uh, can I move faster? Can I be more agile? I mean, there are a lot of different attributes that customers are seeking as they talk about the cloud. I think this morning in the main tent, we talked about the new announcements, new things. There was a lot of focus on analytics in the cloud. You know, we talked about the, the data warehousing, or our Dash DB initiative, uh, Watson Analytics, things we're doing around data refinery and, and data cleansing, big issue for customers. Uh, and to what extent can shared cloud services be a way in which customers can more rapidly get at these capabilities uh, solve some of the underlying in problems a, a, and, a, and get to analytics. In a consumption model that they want, which is cloud-like, right, as a service. Yeah, it, it certainly many, many want that. You know? But by the way, they want a lot of things. Yeah. Our, yeah. our customers <laughs> want it. You know, they want it all. That's the definition of your customer. They you want think, quality. You know, I mean, thankfully, they're coming to you asking for a lot of things. So they want, they want in the cloud, you know, they want on-premise, and they want hybrid. You know, something in between, where, well, I'm not sure I want to move all my data to the cloud. You know, I'm a regulated uh, company, uh, my data's important, maybe I'm not quite ready to put the data in the cloud. Can you give me analytics capability? Can I leverage cloud services in some way? Can I keep my data on premise? Uh, can you give me a hybrid? Can you overflow? Yeah. Um, maybe the data is not as critical from a regulatory perspective, in which case, how much analytics could I push out to the cloud? We have customers that are very interested in leveraging our grid technologies, mm. platform software, um, you know, doing Hadoop and big data analysis uh, using those technologies, uh, ideally suited to a you know, large cloud-based grid type of thing. So lots of scenarios, and this ability to mix and match and pick the way you want to go is one of the unique aspects of the IBM portfolio. I'm so, I, I wonder if I could ask, you, you had talked about earlier the information management, data warehouse, mm -hmm. integration, Hadoop, NoSQL, mm -hmm. SQL, all coming mm -hmm. together at this yep. event. And it seems to be coming together. Why? Why is that? Is that because of the cloud? Can be this transport data is a is a transport. Normally, these things are very or historically very fragmented, sort of horizontal layers. Is that changing? 
Well, first of all, our, our clients are telling us they want to be able to look at it holistically. You know, they don't, they don't view this, you know, they don't view what is available to them necessarily from the perspective of any one mechanism being the perfect answer to their business problem, but rather it's the combination of technologies. And look, we're uniquely positioned to do that. You know, we've been in the Hadoop distribution business for years. You know, we've obviously been in relational database, but we've done non-relational, document stores, image, video, all kinds of things in all these different domains. IBM is, is unique in that regard. So when we run an event like this, we're putting all the pieces together. That's what the event's all about. Show the, our clients all the different things yeah. that come together. Show them, by the way, how our business partners fit into those offerings, the kinds of things that they're doing, and take them through the full, you know, if you will, uh, yeah. structure from end to end of all the possibilities, and then work with them on how do we grab at that portfolio and match it up to their business needs. I think you guys are doing a good job by having these mega events because we have, you're, a lot of, there's a lot of crossover between customers. Some might want a little bit of big data and some DevOps and here and there, and there's no clear like general purpose <laughs> product anymore. So I got to ask that question. You mentioned that they want this integrated model. Mm -hmm. You're seeing integrated suites or stacks where there's a lot of mixing and matching. So as a, as a the grandmaster on the chessboard, you know, you've been in the industry for a while. Have we, can you cor correlate this to other trends and inflection points? I mean, because now you're seeing customers saying, okay, I'm going to build a stack mm -hmm. for this application and workload and be good with it. And that's a great solution. It might not be up to shelf. <laughs> it might be something I can cobble together, some really cool technology, a little Watson here, a little data fabric there, mm -hmm. and some computing. What does this all mean? Help us tease this out. Well, I, look, I think when you step back from all of this, you look at it both historically, uh, and in terms of what the technology permits, you begin to see an evolution that's taken yeah. place around information technology. Um, and when it's expensive uh, and complex, you tend to do it in smaller chunks, more in isolation. I want to solve a series of problems. But time passes, you know, decade after decade, you know, you're buying more <laughs> technology, adding technology, and you hit certain inflection points where the cost of computing comes down, network bandwidth goes up, the possibilities of being able to do things more flexibly now come into focus, and frankly the client says, aha, wait a minute, I always wanted to do these things in combination. It just wasn't affordable before. You know, I, I had this pattern, but nobody couldn't respond to me. You know, the vendor community didn't have a solution. It was always too expensive to bring it together. Yeah. Well, guess what? This confluence, confluence, you know, big data, analytics, mobile, cloud, all these things, you know, allow us to begin to put things together in ways that, frankly, we would have struggled 10 years ago to put together so in what, the same fashion. So what you're saying there is, is that, and then we heard some comments on theCUBE earlier where the old software would throw away skew data that was off the median mm -hmm. because it just didn't have any way to explore that. What you're saying is now you have the ability to go in and, and do things that you could never do before because of the low barrier of entry yep. for the high performance stuff. Yep. And the, affordability, so, the affordability's there, the, the you, cost of computing's coming so down. That's, so, so from a value standpoint, what does that mean for the customer? That means a variety of new choices, right? That's where analytics well, becomes? Well, it means solutions that they could have only have dreamed of before, now they can afford. You know, they can find patterns and relationships that they can monetize they couldn't find before. Uh, you know, they can hunt out the hidden jewels, the weak signals, the things yeah. that, that sometimes eluded them. They're now in a position to actually apply technology in an affordable way. They're able to do something that, that perhaps could have only been done a decade ago in a research lab, you know, or by a heavily funded government entity <laughs> that did it some special yeah. project. Yeah. Now this stuff is available, you know, literally to be deployed in businesses of all sizes. The cloud opens that aperture to almost any company of any size, you know, and the speed and performance of the hardware uh, it makes it possible now to do things that, that previously you just would have passed But on. some of those things you could do in the past with a, a, a services-led engagement and IBM could bring in services on top of all these technologies. How is that changing? I mean, you still have obviously big services component. Are customers getting more self-service? Are you partnering in a different way with customers? Talk about that. Well, I, I think that the requirements for skills remain every bit as high, if not higher, than ever before. Right. You know, the technology moves, the affordability improves, and the bar gets raised on the kind of challenge that, many of the customers here are very adept at, at standing up basic data warehouses, reporting systems. They've had those for years. It's familiar technology. Mm -hmm. You know, now they're going to move to the next level, right? Increase the size of the data, the velocity of the data, and suddenly the degree of difficulty now goes up. I mean, no one here at this conference views a terabyte as being a hard thing to do. In fact, yeah. they're all talking about hundreds of terabytes, yeah, yeah. and many are talking about petascale, petabyte scale. Now, it used to be we used to run contests in the tech industry back in the 90s. <laughs> who had the first terabyte, full terabyte database? Yeah, how big you was know? the room? <laughs> you know, who, 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 was a, who was a terabyte database? You know? and, and there were very few terabyte databases. That's nothing today. That's yeah. child's play. You, yeah. you can buy a thumb drive that's a terabyte. You know, we can stand up a petabyte of storage 
petabyte of, of, of solid state storage inside of a single frame today. You know, just amazing density uh, is possible. So that puts pressure on the software. So let's get back to the software piece because now you have unlimited storage essentially. I mean, not unlimited, but you know, it's not a, a lot. A lot, you have a ton <laughs> available. That means the streaming of the ingestion of data. Mm -hmm. So call it data exhaust, call it, okay, I want everything that's connected to my network, internet of things, where people are mm -hmm. things. I suck it all in, yeah. now I got to do something with it. It creates more noise, the noise barrier is really high. Well, you have to you know, come up with, with uh, technologies and approaches to how you filter. You know, do I want to look at all of it, does it matter? I mean, if I'm looking at financial markets, I probably care about every piece of data. If it's an Internet of Things project with a, with a power company and you're measuring the grid, a lot of it is just status information. You don't care about most of it. But the, the perturbations and the changes, you care about a lot. You know? yeah. So you may ingest more data per day than almost anybody else is outputting, but yet you only care about a modest percentage of it. You know, and so you get this range of scenarios. And the jury's still out on all this, it's still early. So we were, Dave and I were talking about some of the new companies like Splunk, ServiceNow, a lot of these cloud, born in the cloud like companies, well they weren't necessarily born in the cloud, but they, you know, they're now in the cloud, where you have the land and expand business model, that, and the customer's consumption is kind of, they, you know, buy before I, buy by the drink, mm -hmm. take a POC, grow it. Yeah. Now they, they can, they're not as big as IBM, so they're reinvesting all their profits mm -hmm. into growth. So I got to ask you the business model question, you know, as, the, as the, the general looking over the battlefield, you see the skirmishes of these young companies coming up, they're public, sure. they're losing money, they're reinvesting it all in. That business model viable for you guys? You guys going to come in? How do you guys roll out to that landscape with the cloud-like business mm -hmm. model? with all those assets, what's your, how do you view that as, as uh, business? Well, I mean, it's always been the case that, that uh, the things that have been around for a while are the ones that make money, and the <laughs> things that are new don't make money. <laughs> and that's been the case forever. It's not like this is all yeah. of a sudden a new phenomenon. Yeah, Bubble in Silicon Valley's been there before. Yeah, when, you know, we, you know, I'm involved with startups, and you know, obviously in IBM, we've invested in many yeah. technologies that took years. You know, five, seven, five, seven years or more to finally get to the point where we're now making a buck on this. You know, yeah. it's finally making money. So we're quite used to that. You know, we invest over six billion a year in R and D. Uh, we do a lot of new things that we know have long-term payback. Uh, but we have a hundred billion dollar company. Yeah, huge. You know, and we do a lot of things for customers that they pay us for every day. And obviously, there's a margin there associated with the value we deliver. And then we plow that back into into R and D. So we're our own banker in that sense. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, and we do a lot of things that we know have a long-term uh, proposition around making money, but we're not going to see that money you know, on the, the, but on the, business, on the business mix side though, have you seen some changes with the cloud, kind of not forcing your hand, but just adapting to the marketplace? You guys have been very adaptive. You have great sales force, you got a great field service force. Has the customer and consumption of the technology, a lot, a lot of very service oriented mm -hmm. components, you mm -hmm. mentioned a few of them. Has that changed anything? It's a lot of reconfiguration of the... Of the well, the, uh, the good news in the market is that the customers are doing all the above. They're doing everything. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes there's this illusion that you, know, you read about the hot new things and, well, everyone's doing that. Well, it's true. A lot of people yeah. are doing it, but they're also doing a lot of things that we're no longer talking very much about that are an integral part of the way they run their business every day. So it's a very, very big market uh, and businesses are investing across a spectrum of activities. Clearly, we need to continue to invest as we have been now for yeah. many years in the new things they're doing. Cloud, uh, analytics, mobile, social, security, hot growing areas. We need to bring those capabilities onto traditional platforms and, and systems because that's what keeps those platforms and systems vital and yeah. growing. So you know, we have over 100 SaaS offerings in the IBM portfolio right. today. Uh, cloud you know, represents a, a big chunk of revenue for us. Um, you know, certainly nothing to sneeze at, big in terms of the industry, but you know, frankly modest when you measure it against a hundred billion dollar aggregate company. Mm. You know, and that's one of the things that we grapple with, is we're always going through these transitions and the idea you move the investment to where the market's going, you build mass, and we've, we've put yeah. tens of billions of dollars of revenue on the boards in these new CAMS related areas, yeah. but we're on a journey yeah. to a hundred billion dollars. And they're still not big enough to offset you know, the decline yeah. in the other stuff, right? Yeah, so, so it's, you know, the slow growing things, challenge. the yeah, fast right. growing things, Things and yeah. you know that's the world we live in. You got to uh, make the bets. But, I mean, you got to make the right yeah. bets. But the rich yeah. keep getting richer in the software business, um, <laughs> and, and it's true. And you, I, I had to miss your comments last September in Greenwich. I had to leave early, but I read them. You talked about the percentage of contribution in software versus hardware, and mm -hmm. how you guys are yeah. changing your portfolio. But as I say, the the rich keep getting richer. There aren't a lot of nouveau riche. I mean, maybe Salesforce. I guess Salesforce is one. Yeah. Um, why is that, and does that continue? Well, I mean, we all understand that, that in these shiny new things, 
the, the, the valuations relate to the way the market forward values the stock price, right? It's not that they're getting rich off of the net profits of the company. Especially the private companies, to, right. uh, notable private yeah, companies. The net, net profits are not obviously where the money is, the yeah, money right, is right. In, the, Growth. in the perceived value yeah. associated with working on the next new thing, and so you're given that forward value benefit, right? And certainly yeah. more and than some a Some would few argue that's irrational on the know, private side. More than a few millionaires yeah. have been minted uh, <laughs> yeah. in the tech industry <laughs> as a result of, of those kinds of things. But you know, it, it's one of the things that brings energy. You know, obviously the venture firms bring liquidity, um, and that funds the innovation. And they're going to well, be you're winners. Well, you're a buyer of those guys. To, and, you, and you're a buyer of those and guys. And we're an acquirer yeah. of, and, and, of, and, of these and companies. You can argue it's overfunded, but is, isn't overfunding in a way a good thing? You get good innovation, you get to identify well, yeah, I, I, value. I think, I think it's a good thing from, from innovation um, you know, from an economic perspective, right? It, it's that liquidity. You know, if you can, the multiplier effect on liquidity, yeah. for the creation of liquidity is incredibly important to power the economy. You know, and, and if, if that's backed up with good successes, right, and things that really contribute positively to employment, to the GDP, then it's a great use of cash. Right. On the other hand, if you, you build a lot of companies that go into chapter 11, that's not so yeah, good. Yeah, but you're a very selective yeah. buyer of companies. Yeah. I mean, you, you, every yeah. now and then you'll pop a few billion on a, <laughs> on a company, but generally speaking, yeah, well, you guys are yeah. very disciplined. You're a very finicky you're buyer. You're talking about 100 yeah. SaaS acquisitions, basically, or SaaS products, many but of those Some we've created, some we bought. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and so, that, I'm presuming that hasn't changed, that investment discipline, right? We'll yeah, talk no, about we, that a little you know, bit. We're, well, you know, we're held to a, to a different standard, frankly. You know, we, we, we're, we're not in a position to, to not deliver you know, on earnings uh, and cash. You know, we're a different kind of company to invest in. Uh, and so we think very carefully about how we use the shareholders' money. You know, and are we buying things that we can get a good return on? We look for synergy uh, with the rest of the portfolio. We look for a lift. Uh, we look it's also growth. integration cost too. If you misfire on an acquisition, if you overpay and it's not the right call, there's also the cost internal, right? Well, overpay is always bad. If yeah, you look back, but it, bad. if you look back 20 years, what's been a better use of cash, acquisition or R&D? I know it's kind of a loaded question. But <laughs> uh, can you give us an honest you, you opinion? You really on that. can't do. No, it, I mean clearly, uh, given the IBM franchise in the market, the R&D investments that we make are absolutely critical. We would not be where we are today be you know, had we pulled back on R&D. Mm. And we could have invested money in buying companies that would not have gotten us to, to where we are. Yeah. And these, there are massive franchises out there. You know, there are 28 million MIPS of mainframe capacity installed in the world today. You know, the world's businesses run on these systems. That's a level of investment that we have to make uniquely. No one else has that yeah. knowledge and expertise. There's so no there's doubt, R&D is critical. I think you guys really did the right thing. And also you're staying on the right vector in the market. You guys are eyeing the prize. We can see it with the big data and the systems. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of, you're kind of like get modernized on with the customer, but mm -hmm. I think you guys have a good track. I've been very impressed with that. I, but, and I got to ask you though, you know, there's some, besides the tuck unders and product kind of buyouts you might do that might be a, you know, someone that pops up, hell oh yeah, pluck them in, put them into the portfolio. What is the game-changing area that you're watching the most right now in terms of turbulence, where there's opportunity that's, where that the needs de-risking, that you're like, okay, is it, where's the straight and narrow on the business that you see, and where's the area like, okay, I'm watching that sector over there? Well, uh, I mean, in these you know, critical areas uh, that go under the acronym CAMS, you know, we're, we're obviously looking to- CAMS stands for? Um, you know, cloud, analytics, oh, mobile, mobile okay. social, and security. These are some of the hottest growing areas in the industry today. So we're invested in all of them. You know, and obviously you want to invest wisely so you can make poor decisions, but the fact of the matter is that those are the fast growing opportunities. You want to ensure your development dollars are going in that direction, your go to market structures are moving in that direction. That, that, that is something that is, that is, you absolutely have to keep pace with um, and you can really never run fast enough. Yeah. And look, you know, we... we and that's a mix uh, of organic you know, we and inorganic. We, we report on these things every quarter, mm -hmm. and we talk about how's IBM doing in these new areas. Yeah. You know, and these have been very solid, significant double-digit growth spaces. Cloud, you know, 40, 50%. You know, strong analytics growth, big mobile growth. I mean, but look, that's where the market's going. You know, so we like to grow that fast, but we also know those are fast-growing spaces. You know, so we're certainly grabbing, if you will, our fair share. Yeah, yeah. We'd like an even bigger share, who yeah. wouldn't? You know, we got to keep moving the investment, moving the skills, moving the resources uh, in that direction. It's what builds the IBM of the and future. And software is the key component of all of this now. You're seeing that clearly out there. But it's the defining technology. It, 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 what's, it what enables that capability. Uh, by the way, software has to run on hardware. 
at least yeah. the last time I was in the lab, that was <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you gotta so, run on something. And so, you know, there are investments there that are critically important. And, and the customers often can't get at the value of the technology without assistance. So that could be IBM providing yeah. assistance, or it could be the you know, thousands of business partners that are here at this event but providing assistance. But you're sharpening your, your hardware focus and, and narrowing it. There are a lot of skeptics out there. Why are they wrong? Uh, well, because these are good hardware franchises that, that do make money. You know, and we've obviously honed in on where the profits are. Um, you know, IBM used to be a much bigger hardware business. Um, yeah. You know, we yeah. shared this with uh, the Wall Street analysts earlier this year. Yeah. At one time, IBM, 1980, IBM was more than 80% hardware. Uh, 2013, IBM was 17% uh, uh, hardware. You know, dramatic shift to services yeah. and software. But so we're endlessly rebuilding this company. You know, and the rebuild of the company is always focused on where are our customers going, what does the technology allow that opens the floodgates on the next new thing that they want to do, yeah, that, right? Because their aspirations yeah, yeah. for using technology to change their business are what we have to tap into. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, on those years you mentioned, one of the things that was really in place was a kind of an end-to-end -end stack. You had SNA architecture. <laughs> Remember the day you had networking protocols? So a lot of stuff was wired in with, this, with the hardware. So, so, again, that was proprietary in some case IBM, mm -hmm. but now you've got cloud, you've got a converged infrastructure. Kind of an interesting wiring going on, but it's open now. So, are you guys looking at that? Because we see Oracle doing the same thing. They have very specific solutions that really work well with workloads. So, is that kind of the thing, stay standard and open? And is that the stack model? Well, is there what, a certain what, criteria? Yeah, certainly what our customers, I mean, look, th th those that vote with their dollars, the customers, <laughs> they want their cake and they want to eat it too. <laughs> right? so they'll tell you, they'll Faster, tell you, cheaper, smaller. Yeah, but, but, but by the way, they also, they want it integrated, but they want it open, right? They want it modular, they want to be able to mix and match, they want to be able to make changes, yeah. you know? So they want all the above. But by the way, make sure it works well. So, so I mean, th those demands are there. I mean, do people really care if it's a proprietary piece of hardware, if it runs really well and fast and no one really interrupts with everything? I mean, well, I, 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 mean, I, I, I think openness is important. Um, at the same time, they know that once they make an investment in any technology platform, there's an aspect uh, of, of them therefore being on that platform and the cost of changing. So they want to know the vendor is investing yeah, in the platform. It's hard. And by the way, they want to know that, that uh, you're, you're, you're pursuing an open strategy such that more possibilities emerge for them, not just from you, the provider, but also other companies are coming in and supporting that environment. I mean, openness is about building ecosystems. So, so it's okay to have a hardened solution encapsulated together as long as there's choice. Kind of what you're saying, right? Open yeah. means choice, right? O open, Not locked in. <laughs> open means choice. Well, and the proof is in the ecosystem, yeah. as you're saying. Yeah. It, it, and the ecosystem tends to be the test of that, yeah. right? The, truth the, the larger crowds. the ecosystem, the, the more sense of openness that exists. So it, it's a subtle yeah. definitional yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then you, there's a technical view of openness, which is very absolute. Keep you honest. You know? The ecosystem you know, then, keeps you honest. And right? then there's another view of it, which tends to be more driven by choice, yeah, yeah. right? Which can be ecosystem related. So. IBM's always had a pretty heavy planning culture. Uh, given the push toward agility and now the contribution of the ecosystem as a sort of an adjudicator of openness, has that, and I know you've changed in terms of you know, speeding up your, your planning culture, is it changing again? Are you moving faster? Are the things that you're doing internally to speed up decision making? Well, um, be more agile, uh, all the buzzwords associated with that. We work with a lot of companies and we acquire a lot of companies. We, we don't have a problem being as fast as others are. All right, so there are always these notions, somehow or other, if you're big, you can't be fast. And that's just simply- So it's a misperception. And that's just simply not true, right? Because we're constantly moving people, we're moving technologies. It's a relative term, changes. we had nine months go to market on Watson's you know, Herculean. Yeah, you know, we're making changes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we have teams that are unbelievably skilled and, and do, you know, clap. I mean, all of our teams are on agile, you know, small team, very rapid development uh, processes and techniques. Uh, so we've been very good at getting things out the door and out the door quickly. Uh, as always, our customers expect us not just deliver quickly, but also deliver reliability, scalability. You know, we're held to a fairly high standard. We have to make sure those things uh, are, are you know, evident in what we do. Um, I think that, that very often um, there's, a, there's a real need for creative discovery. In other words, you don't find out what the market really wants until you go to market. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you yeah. can build in the lab you know, for forever and never get it right, or you can go to market quickly with something that's less than perfect, you know, and then refine yeah, it, refine yeah. it, refine it. Iterate through, that's you agile, know? right? You know, and I'm sure if you talk to many customers that are here, they can tell you stories of things that IBM delivered to them, and they say, oh, I wish it ran better the first time I got it. 
But the good news is I got it, and then they, they worked on it, worked on it, fixed it, upgraded it, improved it, you know, and I'm on version 10 today. And they like right? it, and they're happy. Yeah, yeah, and, and IBM, you did exactly what you promised to do, and it, when I was an early adopter, I tended to suffer a little <laughs> bit with some of the, the, the rough edges on the code, you know, but I saw you innovate rapidly and you, you, know, you moved to market yeah. leadership with your technology because you were, you were dedicated to rapid innovation. And the, the alternative is, is art, isn't yeah. it? The alternative yeah. is to have a product that has way too many features that they don't want that's sub-optimized. Or, or where you're trying to, to come up with the pluperfect integration yeah. model with all kinds of things and you miss the market. Nightly, you know, nicely fitted together and you miss the market. Mm. Right, you miss the market. So, um, you know, those are the balancing acts that you have to go through. I'd rather be fast. Um, and I'd rather have the market direct me to where I need to go long term than attempt to figure it out in the lab. Steve, we really appreciate you coming on and we love talking with you. It's like, it's like talking to sports, right? It's so much fun for Dave and I. We love talking to industry uh, trends and whatnot. But I've got to ask you, what's next for you? What are you working on now? And um, what are some of the highlights of uh, what's in the, in the moment for your next couple months? And, and also share with the folks something about IBM that they may not know. Um, and, and that would shed some positive insight into what you're working on. Well, I'm, I'm just relaxing here in Vegas. <laughs> 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 on the Cube, <laughs> hanging out. We can talk more if you want. Who's going to win the World Series? Uh, Giants or uh, KC? <laughs> no, we don't want to get into that. <laughs> um, well, you know, our, our, um, uh, our, our passion, our obsession, obviously is technology and the next things that can be done technology. There's probably, there's probably nothing that we're doing at IBM that excites us more than what's happening around Watson, around cognitive computing, around inferencing uh, technologies and all the different things we bring together to make the Watson system. Um, we're working on a lot of fascinating things in, in hardware design and systems design that begin to, to use the structures in a way that start to do a better job of mimicking some of the decision making characteristics and profiles and patterns that we're seeing customers want to get into. There's a, there's a fascinating, and it, it's not that computers are in any way human or becoming human, nor will they take the place of humans, but uh, they're taking on attributes that have more and more human-like characteristics. I think one of the most incredible things we're working on is we're, we're, we're working on ways in which Watson, as a technology, can see. You know, of the five senses that yeah. all of us have, you know, the one that delivers just an extraordinary amount of information at an incredible rate is sight. Yeah. You know, sight is, a, is an amazing learning mechanism. You know, and a, a, a product that can see, and, and by seeing I mean, it's just not a collection of pixels, but there is an it's interpretive engine behind sensory, it. Yeah. That, that you're now taking in sensory input, you know, and new things, new entities, new relationships, uh, new, new aspects of a particular problem now you know, the richness that comes from, from being able to add another sense, if you will, into a tool like Watson is really just extraordinary. So I mean, we're, we're clearly just scratching the surface, but you know, of all the things in, in the technology world we're working on, that, that's one that obviously yeah. has this tremendous attention. It's super, it's, super, it's super popular in the mainstream, but it's also got this really interesting data intelligence layer fabric that's developing out of it, and, and I was commenting to Ray Wang earlier, so the demo last night, and I cut the line, like, hey, come on, I want access. Ah, wait, yeah, you're too small. They didn't say that, but that's my interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I said, and, but, and I'm, so I was kind of complaining to Ray Wang, he's like, dude, nine months go to market, that's Herculean. So, pretty big accomplishments with Watson. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that how you guys see it? You want to, are you guys hurrying up, pedaling too fast, or taking your time? Well, no, we're, we're I mean, I'm constantly encouraging the team to go faster, go right? That, <laughs> but, you know, everything But built, not the expense of quality, right? Because you have some big no, customers. No, I mean, they obviously have to be able to meet the customer needs and requirements, but you know, the knowledge that you develop is something that you build upon, right? Yeah. And when you talk about something, uh, you talk about moving faster, you're moving faster off the back of the things that you've learned that work. How do yeah. you capture that? There are patterns and relationships, that becomes the base on which you then move forward, uh, and it widens the aperture on the kinds of things you can do. So what began as a relatively small number of customers, early adopters getting on Watson now, you know, is quickly you know, moving to be not just dozens, but hundreds, and we have many hundreds now that are queued up going into 2015 yeah. that want to take advantage of this technology. Uh, advisory services, you know, not just some of the leading edge the limitless healthcare application stuff, space. but all kinds of yeah. things where advice is required, right? And wouldn't we all love to have an advisor, yeah. right, that had all the facts, all the data, all the well, information. Well, Siri, Apple Siri's training the mainstream on, that, on this notion of, you know, what's the score of the Giants game? They could parse that pretty well, there, quickly. There are facts. I mean, There's a difference between facts and advice. Yeah, yeah. Well, right? so, so, so facts is just, you know, hand me back yeah. exactly what that is, and there's not a lot of choice. But advice means, 
I have choice. It's ambiguous. It's unclear to me. What are the, what are the best choices? And what's the oh, evidence that yeah. supports the choice right. that, that the system is telling me mm. to make? That's, what Watson, choices. That's, that's what Watson does. That's what Watson does. It's extremely hard to do. It not only gives you an answer, it gives you multiple answers. It shows you why it chose the one that it chose. And then it gives you the evidence back that, that allows right. you to go, aha, now I understand why that is the right answer. I'm going to act upon that advice. Or yeah. that's triggered a new thought. I'm going to put in some more information, mm. see whether or not the advice changes. I'm going to explore this topic even further. You know, and so you think about it in all kinds of domains, whether your job yeah. is advisory, uh, you can think about academia, uh, you can think about some very tough problem solving. You know, imagine if, if everything that you engaged in, your auto mechanic, had an advisor, <laughs> you know, my bill would be a lot lower. Or you as a consumer had an advisor. Yeah, you had an advisor, <laughs> well, share you know, the folks or, out there you know. how hard this is to do. I mean, we always say this is super hard. It's why we, all the geeks get love Watson because mm -hmm. they know how hard it is. But in your own words, how hard is it to really do the difference between what's the score of the Giants game, how tall is the Empire State Building, versus a medical scenario with predictive, prescriptive. Well, it, it's profoundly different and difficult in the sense that, that we've had search technologies for many decades, so long before anybody you know, understood uh, you know, anything that we see on the web today. Yeah. Obviously there were search technologies out there, finding facts. You, know, you put in a simple request, it brings you back facts, add another one, it brings you back facts. Whether it gives you one fact or dozens of facts, you then had to apply your yeah. brain to then understand, okay, so it's telling me this, does that dovetail with what it is I believe it's to be a huge you know, challenge. true and correct, right? Uh, then, you, then you take inferencing. Inferencing is, mm, a, yeah. is a set of concepts been around for forever. Yeah. Uh, within computer science, these are 60s and 70s concepts yeah. that were pioneered you know, going back literally 40 plus years ago. Early AI stuff, right? Kind yeah, of like the, the problem was is that you know, could I ever build anything that was flexible? Yeah. I could build inferencing in a, in a set domain, but I couldn't have a product that matched many domains. You know, so flexible ontology. That's a linguistic ontology kind of thing. Flexible ontology, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And then if I could create a product, uh, would it scale to a large number of users? Because <laughs> it used to work well with a couple of people using it, uh, but yeah. could it work well with thousands of people using it? Yeah. You know, that flexible ontology, that ability to And the to user interface, what are they, what, how are they accessing it? Yeah, understand <laughs> language. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that ability to, to continue to feed the system and continue to increase the amount of information it has because the, the, its ability to get at the truth increases with the quantity of data. Now we're back on our earlier point here yeah. with ingestion. What, what, what's different today? You know, and big data is possible. The petabyte club now, yeah, yeah. you know, and you can build petabyte-based systems. And once you get into that domain, uh, the number of things you're not going to know about become relatively small. You know, and that's the amazing thing the computer yeah, yeah. does. Because none of us can remember all this stuff. <laughs> and even the things that remember, sometimes we question whether or not we remember it correctly or we're right. So imagine you had an advisor that never forgot, right? That always yeah, yeah. made the same associations, right? That didn't make a mistake along the way, and they gave you statistical accuracy to seven decimal places as to whether or not the conclusions that it is reaching really matches true statistical probability versus what your brain does, which is, yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, or I got I mean, too much information you know, overloading. You know, <laughs> and and we, we all know yeah. this, you know, we all make, yeah. you know, we all, we all make right. assertions and assumptions and we've all in our lives declared something to be true and we know it's true and then what happens? We find out, well, yeah. it wasn't exactly what we thought. It wasn't because we were 100% wrong, it's because we just simply couldn't assemble all of the facts in our head, you know, at the moment to be able to reason through the right answer and we ended up in the wrong spot. You know, that's right. exactly why it's so exciting. You just basically outlined three major right. functional areas in the computer industry yeah. in one sentence, like all integrated yeah. in. Yeah. Ingestion, computation, software, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> user experience. Yeah. Man, it's super exciting. So, yeah. if Watson could only improve my golf game, I'd be happy, man. <laughs> it's called to be virtual golf, fantasy <laughs> golf. You, you played yesterday, but you don't know it yet. It's predicting your score. <laughs> yeah. You shot. <laughs> don't show yeah, up. Sadly, my yeah. score is predictable. <laughs> Steve Mills, great to have you on the queue. We love, we love chatting with you. We could go another half hour, but the planes are backing up, as Dave said. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, yep. And supporting the queue. Yep. We love what you're doing. Pleasure, Dave, uh, Watson yeah, and you. analytics, is a, well, cognitive, predictive, reasoning, all come in and help us out. Uh, so powers in the software here at IBM Insight. It's all about the insights. This is theCUBE, sharing our insights with you. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>